Amen. So we are um, continuing a series that we have uh, began last week called The Difference Maker. And this new series is going to lead us up through Easter, and it is a series that is all about Jesus. And it's all about how Jesus is the difference maker in our lives, how he makes the ultimate difference in everything that we do and everything that we are. Uh, when I was in high school, my, my summer job was as a caddy at the golf course that my dad worked at. And so I would have an opportunity to spend a lot of time with people and, and they would often ask me questions, you know, particularly as I got closer to graduation, you know, like what, what's your major, what's your career, uh, what are you going to study, all those things. And at that point, I had already begun to, to feel a call toward ministry and toward uh, studying uh, the Bible. And so I, I would tell them that and it brought up a lot of interesting conversations. And typically, I got the same kind of response, which was pretty much like, God is cool, but he doesn't really matter for what I do in my life. I I remember particularly, I had this one conversation with this gentleman uh, where he said, uh, me and the big guy are good. We have an agreement. I leave him alone, and he leaves me alone. (laughs) And I'm assuming that nobody here has that exact attitude, or you probably wouldn't be here. But I do think that, that that kind of sentiment can have a tendency to creep into our lives, particularly when we begin to separate our spiritual life from our day-to-day physical life. And we say, well, maybe I, I spend some time with God in church and when I'm reading my Bible, but then I leave God and I go to my job and I do all the stuff that I do at my job and God doesn't really affect that, that he doesn't really have a say in what happens in my day-to-day life that he doesn't make a difference in the the problems that I have on a daily basis. And this series is is kind of counteracting that, that's saying, no, Jesus is the difference maker in every area of our lives, that in everything that we do, every moment of every day, Jesus is the one who makes a difference in the way that we live and the way that we act and the way that we respond to life's situations. Amen. And so last week we talked about worry. And we talked about how when we worry, Jesus is the difference maker because he shows us that he cares for us, that God cares for us. Just as he cares for the lilies of the field and dresses them, then he also provides everything that we need. And we can trust God in our worry. And so this week, we're going to talk about when I am hurting, how Jesus is the difference maker when I am hurting and In pain. And so as we get into it, I would love to uh, pause and to go to God together and just open our hearts to God in prayer. And so just take maybe 30 seconds in your seat and just uh, sit in the presence of God and ask to receive His word today. God, we open our hearts to you today. Please speak to us. Help us to hear what you have for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I normally, when I begin a sermon, I try to begin with like a joke or a story or something a little bit lighthearted. But this uh, topic that we have today is a little bit more serious and it's a little bit more heavy. And so I wanted to begin by reading a passage uh, from a book called A Grief Observed by C.S. Lewis. And he wrote this after his wife passed away. And he, he describes the, the experience of grief and all the things that he's noticing about his grief. And then he, he shifts to uh, his relationship with God. And he says this. He says, meanwhile, where is God? This is one of the most disquieting symptoms. You go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face, the sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside, and after that, silence. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence becomes. There are no lights in the windows. It might be an empty house. Was it ever inhabited? And I wanted to begin with this because I think that as Christians, we have this tendency to want to rush through our pain to the joy on the other side because we believe in hope and we believe in goodness and we believe in what God is doing. And all of that is good, but we jump straight from our pain to joy and hope and faith. And this morning, we are going to get there, I promise. But at the outset, I just wanted to acknowledge that in the midst of our pain, In the midst of our hurt, there is this very real feeling, oftentimes, of God being far away from us. 
of feeling shut out from him. And I don't believe that that's a reflection on faith or spiritual maturity or anything like that. Because Jesus himself said from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That Jesus himself has experienced this. And so if you're here today and you are in the middle of hurt, and you are in the middle of pain, and God feels like an empty house, then I want you to know that I'm glad that you are here, and that you are welcome here, and that you can be who you are, where you are, and you don't have to put on a fake church face and pretend like everything is okay. Because God, I believe, and I have been praying that God will speak to you today. That he is going to open the door and he's going to reveal the truth that he has been with you this whole time. And that is my prayer for each of us today. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so we're going to look at a passage of scripture. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 9, uh, starting in verse 18. And Matthew chapter 9, this is a story of Jesus as he interacts with hurting people. And so in many ways, this is an answer to that question, where is God? Because God is wherever Jesus is, and what Jesus does, God is doing. And so we're going to see how Jesus responds to people who are hurting. So this is Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 18. If you got it, say, I got it. If you need more time, say, I need more time. All right. It says, as Jesus was saying this, the leader of a synagogue came and knelt before him. My daughter has just died, he said, but you can bring her back to life again if you just come and lay your hand on her. So Jesus and his disciples got up and went with him. Just then, a woman who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding came up behind him. She touched the fringe of his robe, for she thought, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus arrived at the official's home, he saw the noisy crowd and heard the funeral music. Get out, he told them. The girl isn't dead, she's only asleep. But the crowd laughed at him. After the crowd was put outside, however, Jesus went in and took the girl by the hand. And she stood up, and the report of this miracle swept through the entire countryside. And so this is an amazing passage of Scripture. And it's an amazing story of what what Jesus is doing. And it's a story of two people who are in pain, two people who are hurting, and who go to God for help, go to Jesus for help, and how he responds to them. And we see how Jesus makes all the difference in their lives. And I believe if we look closely, we can see how Jesus makes the difference in our lives, too, when we are in the midst of hurt and when we are in the midst of pain. And so the first thing I notice about Jesus in this passage is that when we are hurting, Jesus pays attention to us. That in this passage, Jesus pays attention. You know, I I think it one of the hardest things about being in pain and about being hurt is not necessarily the thing itself, but it's the feeling of isolation that comes with that. The feeling like nobody sees me or nobody understands me. I remember when when I was in college, I went to visit a friend uh, in Chicago, and and she worked at a homeless ministry there, and and we went and kind of served food and had conversations with people throughout the whole day. And she said something that I I have never forgotten that has has really stuck with me, and she said, the hardest thing about uh, homelessness is not any of the actual, like, issues. It's not about not having a place to live or not having food or not having money or anything like that. It's the fact that no one will look at you. That you, they just walk right by you on the street and they look the other direction and they pretend like you're not even human. And I think that when we are hurting, that's how it feels. It feels like nobody sees us, like everybody's just looking the other way, like nobody understands what I am going through. But Jesus, Jesus looks at us. Jesus pays attention to us. In this passage at the beginning, Jesus is in the middle of a conversation with the disciples of John. And uh, he's talking to them, and then it says, as he was saying this, the synagogue leader came up to him and asked for his help. And then it says, he immediately got up and went. It doesn't say he finished up his conversation. He didn't say, hang on, I'm in the middle of something. He didn't say, I'm busy right now. He just turned and went with the guy. He said, I'm going with you right now. He immediately turned, and he gave him his full attention and his full action. 
He was paying attention to this man. And then he goes, and he's, he's on the way, and, and the woman comes up behind him and touches his robe. And he could have, again, he could have said, hey, I'm, I'm in the middle of something. I'm on my way to do something. I've already told this guy I was going to go help him, and so I don't have time to spend time with you. But that's not what he does. He stops, and he turns around, and he looks at the woman, and he speaks to her. And he has a conversation with her, and he makes her feel seen and heard, and he heals her. That Jesus pays attention to us. Think about how often we talk in passing to other people. Somebody asks you a question while you're walking out the door, and you just kind of yell over your shoulder, you know, or you're in the middle of something, you're on your phone, and somebody asks you something, and you don't even look up, and you just keep talking, and you talk to them without looking at them. But that's not what Jesus does. Jesus stops, and it says he looks at the woman. It's beautiful to me that all throughout Scripture we see that God is looking at us, that he is paying attention to us. Hagar was a, a slave who was cast out by Abram and Sarai, and she's alone in the wilderness with her baby, doesn't know if she's going to survive, and God shows up and speaks to her, and she says, God sees me. Leah was forced to marry a man who did not love her and who did not care about her and who did not want to be with her. And God gave her a child and she said, she named him Reuben, which means God looks because she said, God has looked on my affliction. He saw my pain. Jonah, when Jonah was in the belly of the fish, he says, in my distress, I called and God answered me. And Jonah was on, in the fish because of his own fault, like he did it. And God still listened to him and paid attention to him. The priestly blessing in, in Numbers has this wonderful phrase that says, May God's face shine upon you. God's face is shining upon you. He is looking at you. He cares about you. He wants to be with you. He's paying attention to you. And so no matter where you are or what kind of hurt you are experiencing, even if no one else sees you, God sees you. Even if no one else is listening to you, God is listening to you because God always pays attention to his people. His face is shining on you. I also think it's interesting how the woman approaches Jesus. She thinks to herself, if, if I can just touch his robe, then maybe I will be healed. And it doesn't tell us exactly why she chose to go this route. Maybe she was embarrassed or, or afraid of rejection. But I think it's possible that maybe this woman felt like her need wasn't as important as the other guy's need. That maybe she thought, you know, th this, this guy's daughter has passed away. This is a really big, hard thing. And my thing isn't that big of a deal. And so I don't want to interrupt Jesus. I don't want to get in his way. I don't want to, to, to impose on him. And so I'll, I'll just touch his robe and maybe that will work. And she compares her pain to someone else's pain. And don't we do that? Don't we compare our pain to someone else's pain? And we try to, try to minimize it and push it down and say, well, somebody's got it worse than me. And so I just need to, to suck it up and move on. But that's not Jesus' attitude. Jesus doesn't brush away her pain or diminish her pain or pretend like it's not as important as anyone else's. But he stops and he gives her his full attention because to Jesus, your hurt and your pain is just as important as anyone else's. And he is focused on you. Amen. And then, of course, there's, there's the flip side where we have maybe the the synagogue leader, and I think if I'm the synagogue leader, then I'm comparing the opposite direction. I'm saying, for real, my problem is bigger, so Jesus, let's get this show on the road. Because he's worried about his thing, and he's worried about waiting. He doesn't want to wait for Jesus. But God, and he's worried that he's, Jesus isn't going to have time for him. I think that that probably is, if it were me, that's how I would feel, that Jesus isn't going to have enough time for me. But Jesus is God. Jesus has all the time in the world. He is not worried about the time. And even in his humanity, even where he can't literally look both ways at one time, he still is able to give the fullness of himself to each person. And you and I, we have the Spirit of God, which means that God is fully present 100% with each of us all at the same time. 
so that God is with you and is paying attention to you and is close to you all the time. And we don't have to, to look at anybody else and what God is doing or not doing for us or anyone else, but that we can just know and believe that God is paying attention to me right now and that he wants to be close to me. The other thing I think is interesting in this passage is that it makes a big deal of touch. So it says, uh, you know, the synagogue leader asks Jesus, will you lay your hand on my daughter? And then the woman touches Jesus' robe, and then he goes to the daughter, and it says he takes her hand, and he lifts her up. That Jesus touches at each of these points, and, and a lot of scholars think that this probably, according to Old Testament law, would have meant that he would be unclean, because particularly you weren't supposed to touch a dead body by any means. And so if this made him unclean, then he would have had to go through this whole purification ritual and, and all this stuff. And I think it's interesting that Jesus doesn't seem worried about that at all. Like Jesus is not concerned about what this means and whether it's too unclean or too hard or too messy for him, but that Jesus just goes toward us, just goes toward them. You know, I don't know if you've ever experienced this where you've been uh, hurting or, or in pain and you've tried to share with someone what that experience was like and you try to express how you feel and you do it and then you realize as you're doing it that this is too much for this person. And it gets uncomfortable and it gets awkward and you can feel them pull away. But Jesus never does that. Jesus does not pull away from us. Jesus moves toward us and he is not afraid of whatever mess is in our lives, whatever mess is in our hearts, but that he just moves toward us and he's close to us and he brings us to himself. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. If you are brokenhearted, God is close to you. He is not moving away from you. He is moving towards you. He is calling you daughter. He is calling you son. He is taking your hand and he is lifting you up. Because Jesus is paying attention to you when you are hurting. Jesus pays attention to us. The second main thing that I think we see from this passage when we are hurting is that Jesus turns our pain into joy. Jesus turns our pain into joy. And where I, I think we see this is really simply just in the fact that Jesus does the healing and he does the resurrection. That he takes sickness and he turns it into wholeness. That he takes death and he turns it into life. That in everything in life, he turns our pain into joy. Imagine the joy of being sick for 12 years. In the, the parallel of accounts in the Gospels, it says that she had seen doctor after doctor. She'd been trying to figure it out, and it hadn't been figured out. And then all of a sudden, Jesus heals her, and the joy that she must have experienced. Think of the joy of the father who sees his daughter raised to life. You know, it says that they, they had people in the house playing funeral music, so they've got instruments there. I imagine when the resurrection happened, they thought, well, we got instruments. We might as well have a party. And so they just start playing music and dancing, and Jesus is doing the cha-cha slide and all this stuff. And there, you know, there's joy. There's celebration. Because Jesus turns our pain into joy. Here's the thing. I, as we talk about Jesus turning our pain into joy... I think that there is a danger here, and the danger is that we can just kind of say, uh, uh, try to say that whatever Jesus did here, he's going to do exactly in your life and just leave it there. That Jesus healed, healed the woman, and so he'll heal you. That Jesus resurrected the girl, and so he'll resurrect whatever you need. And, and the problem that I've been wrestling with all week is that that is true in a sense, but it's also not true in a sense, because all of us have experienced where we have been hurting where we have been suffering, where we've been facing some situation, and we have prayed, and we have prayed, and we have prayed, and it didn't change, and the situation stayed the same. The relationship didn't heal, the, the cancer got worse, the depression didn't go away. We faced C.S. Lewis's empty house, where we thought, what is happening? And of course, maybe I was thinking about, well, maybe I can explain that way away and just say, well, it's a problem on my end. Maybe I didn't do it right, maybe I don't have 
out of faith, maybe I'm not holy enough, but I can look at other believers who are far more godly and far more holy and far more faithful than I, and they've gone through the same thing. I can look even to the apostle Paul, who had that mysterious thorn in his flesh, and he prayed three times that it would be taken away, and God did not take it away. And he didn't reprimand him for not having enough faith either. He just simply, gently reminded him, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. I think as we talk about turning our pain into joy, we have to be honest about the reality of pain. Howard Thurman has a great essay on suffering, and he begins with this simple statement, suffering is universal for mankind. Everyone has experienced suffering, and the Bible does not shy away from human suffering. It does not explain it away or rush past it. In the Psalms, we see all these Psalms of lament, and the Psalms of lament all have this same pattern where it's, it's an expression of feeling, it's an expression of, of the grief and mourning in the midst of suffering, and then it moves to worship. But the movement to worship does not mean that the suffering is gone. It's a choice to worship in the middle of the suffering. It's a choice to praise God before the situation changes, before God provides the healing. And so as we look at our text today and the miracles that Jesus does and the joy that Jesus brings to these people, I don't think what Matthew is trying to communicate by retelling this story is that if you just have faith like this woman, then God will automatically change whatever situation you're in. I think what he's trying to communicate is something specific about Jesus and about the kind of character that Jesus has, that Jesus is the difference maker between sickness and health, that he's the difference maker between death and life, that he's the difference maker between pain and joy. And ultimately, these miracles are markers preparing us for what Jesus is going to do in his own resurrection. And it's in Jesus' resurrection that we find our ultimate joy and our ultimate hope. It's in what Jesus is doing to remake the whole world to turn our pain into joy. And so in our life now, sometimes in God's timing, God does change our circumstances and God does provide the miracle now. I actually had um, the privilege this year of being close to one of those. That hasn't happened very often in my life, but I went and visited a family in the hospital, and, and we prayed, and we prayed, and I, I, didn't, I left the hospital genuinely not knowing what God was going to do, and I, I hoped, and I believed, and I prayed, and God did come through, that he did, and there was a healing that occurred, and that was awesome, and that was amazing, but frankly, in my life, that has been rare, and I, so I think we have to look to a greater hope than what is happening right now, that we have to look to a future hope. Paul in 1 Corinthians says, if our hope in Christ is for this life only, then we are more to be pitied than anyone else in the world. And listen, I am, I am on the record that God cares about this life right now, and he is interested in what is happening in this life right now. And we shouldn't just be biding our time, waiting for heaven, but heaven is our ultimate joy. Heaven is where the true joy happens. There are uh, nine resurrections that happen in the Bible. I looked it up this week. Nine, including Jesus. And for all eight of the resurrections other than Jesus, those people eventually died again. And so the resurrection was good. The miracle was good. But it wasn't the ultimate hope because it didn't, didn't deal with the biggest problem of the brokenness of this world. And what Jesus is doing in his life and in his death and in his resurrection is he's dealing with the ultimate brokenness of this world and making a way for us to be in heaven eternally with God forever. That that's what we're, our hope is in. That's what our joy is in. And that joy is far better. I love, love, love Revelation 21.4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death. And no more sorrow and no more crying, which I'm doing right now. I knew I was going to. No more pain. All these things are gone forever. Forever. What would it be like to live in a world without death or sorrow or crying or pain? We can't even imagine. What would it be like for those things to be gone forever. That is the hope that we have in Jesus. That is the joy that awaits us. 
And I believe that if we put our hope in that joy, in that future joy, that the joy of that day can begin to fill us even now, even in the middle of our pain, before God changes our circumstances, that we can experience the joyful presence of God where we are now. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen ads or uh, I don't even really know totally what this is or how this works, but you get like an early payday. Uh, I've seen like checking accounts that do this. And so it's like you can get your, your paycheck up to two days early. And I assume that this works because the bank knows that it's coming. They've confirmed it somehow. And so they front you the money and say you can have access to this money before it actually arrives in your account because we are confident that it will come. Let me tell you something. We know beyond a shadow of the doubt that the joy of heaven is coming. And so we have access to it now. It's in your account. The joy of God is available to you right now because we know what God is bringing. That's the good news of God. And so I don't know how God works out the timing of everything and what he's going to do in in your particular circumstance or your particular pain, but I do know that there is joy in God and that at the end, God is making all things new. And that's our hope. That's the hope that we have in God. Uh, The band can come. And as we close, I I want to just hone in on something about Jesus here. You know, I I mentioned that essay by Howard Thurman on suffering. He says at the end there that the answer to suffering is best seen in love. And he says that in love, God can make death an instrument in the hand of life. And what he means by that is that our suffering can have meaning if it brings life to someone else. That if you think of, of someone giving up their life for someone else, that they are allowing the suffering that they are enduring to provide good for someone else and to bring life to someone else. And that is exactly what Jesus does. That Jesus gives up his life for us so that we might have life. In Isaiah, it says, by his wounds, you are healed. That the suffering that Jesus endured innocently of no fault of his own is something that he used to provide life to every single one of us. And so Jesus laid down his life for us. He said, no greater love has man than to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus' sacrifice, Jesus' willingness to give up his life shows us his love, his deep and abiding love. And it shows us ultimately that whatever grief and pain and struggle that you are experiencing, that Jesus has experienced that too. That he doesn't just suffer for us, but he suffers with us. That he enters into the suffering that we have and he takes it on himself and then he rearranges it and brings resurrection out of it and provides new life to all of us. And so Jesus gives us life. And I don't know where you are or what kind of hurt is in your life, but I believe that the most powerful answer to pain is Jesus. And it's in his life, and it's in his death, and it's ultimately in his resurrection. Scripture tells us that Jesus suffers with us. Because he suffers with us, he knows what it is like, and so he pays attention to us. He is looking at you in the midst of your suffering. And ultimately, he uses that to bring about healing of not just your life, but of the entire universe. And one day, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And all of the hurt and all of the pain that any of us have ever experienced will be wiped from the face of the earth. And he will turn our mourning into dancing. And he will turn our pain into joy. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. You are so, so, so good to us. God, this world is broken. 
This world is hard. And I know so many of us are going through so many difficult things. God, I pray that you would, you would make your presence real to them right now. That they would feel your presence in their lives. That they would know that you are with them. That they would believe that you are with them. I pray that you would turn their pain into joy. That you would, you would help them to, to see your goodness. God, help us to see your goodness. Help us to know and to love you above all else and to attain the power of your resurrection in our lives now. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. By the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 As we enter into a time of decision. This morning, I just, I, I wanted to provide an opportunity for you if you're here and, and you do feel like you're in a season of hurt and a season of pain. And so we're going to have our prayer team come up front and you can come down with them if you want to and you can pray with them. But if, if you want to, you can just stand where you are and then I want the church to come around those people. And I want us to pray for them. And so um, it, it, as the band sings, uh, you guys can stay seated for now, and we'll just give an opportunity for people to stand up, or if you want to raise your hand, and people will gather around you and pray for you. Can we do that? Amen. So let's sing. And if you feel like you want prayer for what's going on in your life, would you just stand or come down to the front, and we'll gather around you.